Okay, I'm going to uh, start now. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a webinar about uh, ice damming and other winter concerns. And uh, my name is John Stevens. I'm with KIPCON Incorporated. And I'm going to take you through this today. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the Northeast, there are periodic concerns with ice damming. Um, further north you go into New England, it's pretty much an every winter occurrence. In New Jersey and other areas like that, it, it happens occasionally, uh, depending on the nature of the winter weather that we have. Um, I've been a few technical difficulties, but here we go. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, having to do with roofs, um, the parts of the roofs, how roof systems work, uh, winter problems with the roof, roof systems. Uh, there'll be a continuing education keyword, uh, causes of ice damming, symptoms, and solutions. So just a, a quick uh, run through about roofs. Um, there's quite a few parts to a roof, um, depending on uh, the type of construction, but typically you have, um, and the uh, most important areas we're gonna be talking about today, uh, the eaves, the soffits, uh, valleys, and um, sidewalls with uh, flashing and, and dormers as well. <clears throat> um, the ridge is the uh, the peak of the roof, commonly called, and um, that's a, that's another area we'll touch on today. All right. So typically, uh, when, when you're talking about ice dam, you, you're generally talking about shingled roofs um, that that have a slope to them. Um, so roof shingles are not waterproof. Uh, they're designed to be um, water resistant and they rely on the slope of the roof and gravity to uh, have water shed off of them um, into gutters or off, just off the edge of the roof onto the ground. Um, they also rely on flashing in various areas. Um, the photos here show sidewall flashing which is typically called uh, step flashing. Um, the, the shingles butt up against the wall and small pieces of uh, metal flashing are used to uh, seal off the edge or the seam between the, uh, the roof and the sidewall. Um, and that's a pretty critical part of the building um, envelope that helps keep water from penetrating. Um, and you look at the bottom photo, uh, you will see what at the very bottom of that line of uh, metal flashing is a, a piece of white flashing, and that's called um, kickout flashing. And that's designed, it's hard to see in this photo, but it, it actually at the bottom is bent out uh, toward you in the view here. And that's designed to push any water that runs down off the bottom of the roof there into the gutter that you can see in the bottom of the photo. And clearly without this flashing or being able to seal that the joint between the roof and the sidewall, the building will uh, get water in penetration. Um, so flashing um, has to be installed pro properly. If you look on uh, the right, um, photo or write a sketch that's labeled bad, you'll see the, um, the, the house wrap or the Tyvek is actually run down behind the flashing. And what that allows is water that runs down uh, the side wall behind the siding can penetrate behind the flashing and then leak inside the building. Proper way to do it is have the house wrap over top of the uh, flashing and counter flashing so that any water that runs down on the surface of the house wrap sheds off and, and doesn't penetrate. 
So there's different types of flashing materials. Um, the most common, particularly for sidewalls or, or anywhere really is metal uh, flashing. And it can be steel, zinc, aluminum, uh, various kinds of metal, but um, it's, uh, it's definitely the most commonly used flashing. The, there are uh, rubber, rubberized or plastic materials that can also be used. And these are typically used in conjunction with metal flashing, but they can be used alone. Uh, the problem with those is uh, they're not as long lasting. Uh, they are less expensive, but they also, if exposed to the sun, uh, will degrade over time from the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Another uh, aspect of roof uh, systems are on shingled roofs are gutters and downspouts. And they're, they're intended to carry any water that runs and sheds off the shingles would be, uh, you know, would go into the gutters and then be carried away and drained away by the downspouts that are located periodically along the gutter line. Uh, the gutters and downspouts are sized for the for the size of the roof and also the uh, the local uh, average rainfall uh, based on the sections of the uh, the building code that's would be used. It's also typically attic space. Um, cathedral ceilings don't have attic space, and, and I'll touch on those. But typically, there's an attic space above uh, the living the living space. Um, the attic helps to control temperatures in the house by being ventilated and insulated, and also, depending on the design, can be used for storage. Um, the, the, what you see in this photo is the framing that supports the roof, and uh, you can see the uh, ceiling of the living space below uh, at the bottom of the photo. Also, it, an important aspect of attic uh, construction is insulation. Um, it, it's designed, again, according to the building code. Uh, the insulation keeps heat from escaping out of the living space, um, or it reduces the amount of heat. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent it, but it reduces the amount of heat coming out of the uh, living space, helping to um, keep the living space warmer in the winter and uh, cooler in the summer. And um, it's, uh, this is, this is for, with regard to ice damming, the attic is a critical area because of uh, heat, es heat escaping from the living space and also sometimes lack of proper ventilation, which I'll touch on in a minute. <clears throat> uh, you can see in this photo, there's, um, uh, in between the roof framing, there's these pink shaped uh, pieces. And those are what are called baffles, ventilation baffles. Those are installed at the edge of the insulation to allow uh, ventilation air to come in from the outside and get up into the attic space. Uh, without those, the, the insulation typically would block, uh, block off ventilation and cause problems, uh, particularly with ice damming. So attic ventilation, in addition to insulation, is uh, very important. Uh, you need to vent the air in the attic um, to keep moisture from building up and also to keep, uh, keep it cooler in the winter uh, so that it helps to mitigate any ice damming issues. So typically, you have soffit vents at the bottom um, where cool air is brought into the attic. And then you have vents up at the top of the roof near the ridge, which uh, would vent the uh, the warm air from the attic to the outside. Um, and also, if you, you'll see in this illustration, it shows a bathroom or kitchen exhaust vent, and you'll see that that's that is exhausted directly through the roof to the outside to prevent that from uh, adding to the uh, the warm and humid air in the attic space. Um, So you want the attic to stay as close to the outside temperature as possible, both winter and summer. Uh, warmer than normal attic 
is not good in either season. Cathedral ceilings are, uh, they're a little bit, they're, they're quite a bit different than uh, an attic space, but the same concept applies. You have insulation at the top of the framing. You just have a much smaller space to, uh, to provide ventilation, but it's the same concept. In the space you do have, you want cool air coming in from the soffit vents, warm air being exhausted at the top of the roof, either through ridge vents or other types of ventilation. So one thing to keep in mind, um, the, the, uh, the roof works as a system. And so all parts of the roof are important. And um, so, you know, the first, the first line of, uh, of defense, so to speak, are the shingles and flashing, which keep water out of the building. Uh, the insulation that's installed in the attic space or in the cathedral ceiling space uh, keeps the, the house cool in the winter, I'm sorry, warm in the winter and cool in the summer by preventing heat loss um, from the living space up into the attic or through the cathedral ceiling. And then the um, attic ventilation helps to cool the, the attic space throughout the year and also keeps moisture and condensation from occurring in the attic in the winter time. Uh, the condensation is a particular problem in the winter time because of the uh, large difference in temperature between the living space and the attic space. The attic space is typically a little warmer than the outside air, but not significantly, whereas the, the living space inside is usually 68 to 72 degrees. And the, the um, if that warmer air that escapes from the living area builds up in the attic space, the moisture in it will condense out and cause problems in, in the attic. <clears throat> so, um, the diagram on the left shows what we call a functional attic. It's heavily insulated. Uh, the uh, bathroom or, or kitchen exhaust vents go directly through the roof to the outside. You have good air ventilation from the soffits. You have baffles to allow the air to get into the main attic area. And then you have vents at the top of the roof to uh, exhaust the warmer air out and the mo and moisture laden air out. Uh, another thing to, to that's important is any floor penetrations from the living space through the attic. And these are things like uh, um, recessed lighting in particular, but other, other penetrations as well, allow heat loss from the living space into the attic space and uh, increases the warmth of the attic. So those should be sealed and uh, you know properly installed so that it minimizes how much uh, heat loss uh, escapes from those areas. <clears throat> On the right is what's labeled the dysfunctional attic. Um, minimal, vent, minimal insulation, um, block soffit vents, um, or excuse me, Blocked, blocked or no soffit vents, um, condensation in the attic, lack of uh, exhaust vents at the top of the roof. And these are the conditions that help to, or, or uh, make ice damming, ice dam form or be more severe than they otherwise would be. So one thing to consider, um, even on a properly installed roof, ice damming problems are caused by mother nature or by the weather. Um, an improperly installed roof can make the situation worse or more severe, but even on a roof that's, that's proper and is uh, installed sh as shown in the functional attic diagram, uh, ice damming can still occur. Um, typically what, when ice dams form as a result of a specific set of weather conditions, um, first thing is you need a blanket of snow on the roof. 
without a moisture source, which is the blanket of snow, uh, ice damming can't occur. Um, the other thing you need is um, temperatures below freezing um, and they stay below freezing even in the daytime or they get just minimally above freezing in the daytime and are below freezing all night. And what happens then is um, the because the warmer air in the attic is escaping at the upper part of the roof, either at the ridge or, or near the ridge, <clears throat> that part of the roof is warmer than the lower part down at the eaves. And you can see in this photo, um, if you look toward the upper part of the roof, you can see there's bare shingles up there. You can see black, uh, the snow has melted up there, but at the lower part of the roof, it's obviously, obviously heavily laden with ice and with these huge icicles forming. So um, the, uh, the, the ice forms when you have a blanket of snow and the, the melt occurs at the ridge line or up at the upper part of the roof. And um, this, this diagram on, on this slide shows it a little bit better. So you have indoor heat loss at the upper part of the roof raises the roof surface temperature above 32 degrees. The blanket of snow acts as an insulator. And what happens is the bottom layer of the snow actually melts and runs down the roof underneath the, the blanket. Uh, as it gets down to the edge of the roof, um, it, the temperatures down at the eaves are colder. And if they're below freezing, then that liquid water will refreeze at the edge of the roof. And as that process continues to occur, the ice at the edge at the eaves builds up and forms a dam. And that's, that's where the term ice dam comes from. Um, the, uh, then what, what can happen is when the ice builds up enough to prevent what the liquid water that's flowing down from the upper part of the roof, uh, if, if that's prevented from escaping off the edge of the roof, it can be backed up behind the ice dam and then starts to penetrate up under the shingles and then into the interior of the uh, building. And then that, that causes obviously a leak in the interior space. And also um, a thing to consider is until the weather conditions change, there's really, there are some ways which I'll get into later, but it's very difficult to stop this leak from continuing to occur until either all the snow melts off the roof um, or the weather gets warm enough that the ice dam dissipates. Um, if the water is leaking in, it'll continue to leak in, and that that creates major problems. And some of these photos here show you what uh, the results can be. Um, the, the the top right photo clearly shows ice buildup, damaging the gutter uh, on this this particular building. Uh, if you go counterclockwise, uh, the one. The next one shows the soffit, and you can see there's a solid area of ice inside the soffit, which has caused the soffit to, to uh, be damaged and fall. Um, the bottom photo shows damage to the uh, roof sheathing, and um, you know from a prolonged period of ice damming. And then uh, the last photo at the bottom right shows uh, interior uh, ceiling damage from, from the water. So when you, um, you look at a roof after, after a snowfall, uh, it typically looks like the uh, diagram on the left where it says typical post snowfall pattern. And that can vary depending on if there was wind and you know, they blew the snow off in some areas, but, you know, it's pretty typical to see a roof that looks, roofs that look like this after a snowstorm. Um, and depending on the, the age of the house and how well it's insulated, <clears throat> older houses that are not well insulated will look um, 
pretty typical to the diagram, the second one from the left, um, where there's a lot of heat escaping in the attic. It pretty quick, quickly melts the snow off the upper part of the roof, but then you can see it's accumulated at the bottom. And again, there's evidence there of ice dams. Um, now, because the snow on, a, on what's called a heat waster uh, melts very quickly, the ice dams don't typically stay around as long uh, because the water source is cut off at, at that point. And even though there's ice there, there's no liquid water anymore to penetrate and, and cause leaks. Um, modern buildings, which are much more heavily insulated, uh, tend to have a snow pattern like the next slide to the right which um, there's enough heat for the snow to melt at the upper portion of the roof, but it doesn't melt off quickly. And so you continue to have um, a, um, a source of liquid water coming down uh, from the upper part of the roof to the lower and then ice dams forming. And then because you still have liquid water for a longer period of time, that's when you can start getting leaks um, into the attic space and then into the inside of the, of the house or the unit. Um, and then the far right diagram shows what's called a cold roof. If, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little further, but basically a cold roof maintains the attic temperature close to or the same as the outside temperature. And what happens there is you don't get the kind of liquid melting underneath the blanket of snow and therefore you don't get ice dams at the uh, at the eaves and the problems that result from them now a cold roof is very difficult to achieve without special roof construction which uh in the new jersey you know new york area this part of the country uh is not cost effective to do in areas where it's cold all the time, it's essentially building a double roof and insulating it so that the outside surface and the, the attic temperature are pretty much the same. Very uncommon to see around uh, the, the area of the country that we live in. So here's the keyword for anybody uh, getting continuing education credits. It's sublimation. Sublimation is basically a solid transitioning to a gas without actually melting. And this occurs with snow from uh, a lot of times from solar um, energy. When it's sunny, you'll get snow that basically doesn't melt. If it's below freezing, it doesn't melt, but it also will over time disappear. And that's from sublimation. So obviously there's, you can have a, a well-constructed roof. Um, you can uh, insulate it properly. You can uh, ventilate it properly, but, and that can still have ice damming, but there are things that aggravate uh, the, the severity of the ice damming. And one of these factors is inadequate ventilation. Um, one thing to consider in the building codes, there are requirements for minimum amount of attic ventilation. And that minimum amount will not prevent ice damming. Um, it's intended to provide the amount of ventilation that will allow uh, the roof shingles to achieve their, their full life without being overheated, will allow, uh, keep moisture out of the attic space, uh, condensation related moisture to prevent deterioration of the, um, the, the roof framing and the fasteners in the roof framing, uh, but it's not intended to prevent ice damming. So one of the things when we do roof, you know, re-roofing re of buildings, you want to try to improve the ventilation uh, because there's no such thing as too much ventilation. And also, it has to be looked at in conjunction with um, proper or, or improper insulation in the case of an aggravating factor. <laughs> so, 
you know, imp improper um, ventilation helps to make ice dams more severe. And, and some of the things, uh, if you look in this photo here, uh, the attic fan that's in the photo on the left, if you don't, if you, most attic fans are, uh, use a thermostat to come on because they are primarily thought about for summertime when the attic space gets very hot, you, you have a fan that draws cooler air in from the outside and helps to uh, vent that hot air out of the attic. Um, if they do not have a humidistat, they will never come on in the winter uh, because the, the air doesn't ever get hot enough in the attic to kick, uh, trip the thermostat. But if they have a humidistat, which comes on when a certain level of humidity is reached in the attic, then they will function in the winter time and will you know, help to ventilate the moist air out of the attic in the winter. <clears throat> the photo on the right shows vents that are working at cross purposes. There's a ridge vent at the top of the roof, but there are also these square air vents halfway down uh, the shingles in this photo. Those, um, those uh, vents work are working against each other. The um, cool air is being drawn in from the soffits, which are not visible in this photo, but it's, it's being vented out of the roof where those, those square vents are. And it's not reaching the ridge vent, so you still have air between the ridge and the soft, uh, the ridge and the square vents that's warm, and there's no there's no uh, chimney effect to get intake and, and exhaust. And so you should either have one or the other of these, either the ridge vent or the square vents, and they should be located further up the roof to get proper exhaust. And all of those things allow warmer air to stay in the attic and just uh, exacerbate the, the conditions where the warm air is causing snow melt. Also, um, either with regard to insulation, either, uh, you know, not enough insulation or too much uh, insulation that's blocking the ventilation are both uh, a problem with regard to, well, in, in general, your attic space, but in particular to ice damming. <clears throat> the photo on the left, you can see that there's a chase, uh, that hole in the floor there, coming up from below, from the living space, which is clearly venting, exhausting a lot of warm air, but there's no insulation over it, and it's not sealed to prevent that from happening. So that location is basically a hot spot in, in the attic space and, and will cause problems with heat loss. Um, another thing that you, you should consider and a lot of people probably don't think of is insulating the attic access hatch, if, if there's one, um, because if that's not insulated, that's, a, again, a big void or hole in the, in the uh, insulation blanket that's allowing a lot of warm air to get into the attic space in the winter. Um, and then again, um, blocking of ventilation by insulation is also a problem. Um, uh, if you, on the right hand photo, the insulation is out all the way to the edge of the roof. But in this case, there's, there's, uh, baffles there to green, the green pieces that are allowing, um, the, uh, the air to flow. But if those weren't there, that insulation would block off the airflow and, and just basically circumvent any, uh, any ventilation you have in the attic. And then one of, the, one of the main problems, I talked about it earlier, condensation. And uh, basically the, the example here with the glass, the cold glass is the, the outside air and then the warm, Moist air is the air that escapes from uh, from the living space into the attic space. And if there's not proper ventilation, uh, that will result in condensation. And basically, if it's bad enough, it can actually uh, leak inside the unit. 
here's an example condensation you um, it's hard to see in this photo but uh, the cold sheathing actually has moisture condensing on it and there's evidence of actual droplets coming off the sheathing uh, down onto the insulation the warm air can come from if dryer vents bathroom vents kitchen vents are not exhausted properly and exhaust into the attic space also running humidifiers uh, can add moisture to the air and again that's why proper uh, ventilation is important and um, as I touched on earlier uh, the um, the ventilation issues or lack of ventilation can result in water on the sheathing dri dripping in the attic and rusted and deteriorated fasteners and eventually the uh, wood components as well <clears throat> so ice damming ice damming and leaking can occur at uh, other problem or other vulnerable areas as well sidewalls in particular um, normal roof uh, installation you have five inches of flashing going up the wall and and the underlayment or the roofing uh, paper runs maybe three or four inches up the sidewall so if snow builds up higher than that on against the sidewall it can leak through these uh, through these areas and also around chimneys basically the same thing and you can see in the photo above that in some cases snow builds up very heavily on roofs valleys are another area um one of the things you have there is you know a lot of snow build up um excuse me a second i have uh Um, sorry. Uh, so the valleys will will also allow um, ice stamps to form. And in particular, in this one, you see at the bottom, the piece of metal uh, that sticks up from the gutter, that's a diverter. So normally when ru water runs off the roof in, in the summertime or when it's not frozen, um, that's there to prevent it from overflowing the gutter. And there's my, my guess would be that below that is uh, a door or entrance door or something that uh, you don't want water overflowing the gutter and dripping onto onto people. So that makes that worse by having that installed with regard to ice damming. Um, so there's not really any short-term solutions, but people do try to do different things to help mitigate. Uh, one is uh, removing the gutters and downspouts. Um, hard to do unless you do it before winter starts it's hard to do when the roof's full of snow and ice uh, can damage things the shingles and the gutters uh, typically if they're full of ice and you take them off uh, they are going to um, um, they're going to be damaged and, and new gutters are going to have to be put up um, and also even without gutters on the roof ice dams can form uh, also removing the snow uh, the photo on the right, you see somebody up on the roof shoveling the snow off. Um, very dangerous to do, obviously. And also, um, if you don't remove all the snow off the roof, the ice dams will form in a different location. If you just take it off at the eaves, the ice dams will just form further up the roof. And in all likelihood, you're going to damage the shingles by using the shovel uh, on them. Um, but People will try uh, emergency kind of measures to, uh, you know, to try to mitigate the problem because, as I said earlier, if you have, um, you know, if you have long-term conditions where they're favorable for ice damming and you have ice dams and you're getting leaking, that leaking will not stop until those conditions dissipate. And the roof is not covered with snow and the temperatures are not con conducive to, uh, you know, ice dam formation. And so in desperation, sometimes these measures will be taken. Um, they're not really recommended uh, because of the, the, uh, the issues they cause. 
shoveling the snow off the roof in particular is very dangerous and um, probably not worth somebody being seriously injured, uh, falling off the roof uh, to stop a leak. And uh, as I just said a couple of minutes ago, ice damming can still form without gutters. Uh, the same principles. The gutters will maybe uh, make it easier for the ice dams to form, but the same principles apply. A blanket of snow, warm air at the ridge, uh, snow melt under at the base of the snow blanket, gets down to the eaves, colder there, it, it re, uh, refreezes and an ice dam occurs. Yeah. So taking the gutters off is a short-term solution uh, very short term because if the weather conditions persist, uh, so will the ice dams. Uh, now, longer term, you know, solutions. Uh, typically, you'll see this in areas where ice dams occur uh, every year, are the use of heat cables. Um, covers on the gutters and, and different types of things that are tried. Um, and heat cables, obviously, um, they're connected to the electrical system. And uh, when they're turned on, they warm up, they melt the snow at the eaves and uh, prevent ice dams. Again, though, the problem with these is if the blanket of snow persists on the upper part of the roof, ice dams can form further up the roof out of the, the range of the heating uh, elements. Um, they're also obviously costly to operate and require maintenance and, um, you know, to keep them operating uh, unless, you know, they are not left on all the time. So they would have to be turned on and off by somebody or have a system where uh, remotely they're able to be turned on and off, but there's, there's some, uh, some requirements there. They, they're not just automatically operating. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this doesn't really prevent ice dams. It, it moves the location for the most part, uh, but this is pretty common in more northerly areas where ice dams occur all the time. And in the lower photo, you can see that it, what, what the, what's installed there really isn't even that effective because it doesn't even, it's not even melting the snow uh, completely off at the eaves. And you can see the, the deep blanket of snow above the, uh, the end of where the cables are, are heating. And that will still be a problem. So there's a couple of things, uh, you know, again, we talked about in the attic space, um, make sure that everything is well insulated and well ventilated and heat source problems uh, or heat sources that would allow excess heat from the living space up into the attic space are properly sealed and, and insulated. So um, in, in the case of if you have a uh, heating system, you know, unit in the attic, which isn't, it, it's relatively common. Um, you have to make sure that the ducts are, are um, properly insulated and sealed. You're not getting uh, heat loss from the ducts. And even if you don't have the unit in the attic, if there's ducts up there, it's important to make sure those are, are sealed up properly and insulated properly to uh, prevent excessive heat from escaping. Um, you know, I talked about attic access hatch, um, recessed lights, you know, things of that nature, all needing to be uh, properly sealed and or insulated to prevent or to minimize uh, heat loss. You're going to get heat loss anyway, but you're trying to minimize it and combine that with a lot of ventilation to uh, you know, to try to keep the attic space as cool, cool or cold as possible. Um, and, you know, uh, I just was mentioning this uh, leak, air leak, leakage out of uh, heating ducts 
and improperly or not, not no insulation of uh, heat ducts are major areas where uh, heat loss can occur. And this, this uh, diagram shows uh, you know, a lot of insulation, everything sealed, everything, uh, the ducts insulated, um, baffles to allow good ventilation and you know things of that nature to recess lights sealed stuff like that um and that's you know that's one thing you can do to an existing roof um the other things that can be done and uh well improving ventilation um uh, we talked about that earlier making sure that the soffits are, are clear of insulation through baffles or just pull back the insulation from the soffits. Um, put in a mechanical vent, but as I said earlier, you know, an attic fan or some other type of mechanical vent that uses a humidistat as well as a thermostat so it operates both summer and winter. Um, and and properly install passive ventilation, um, which would be either ridge vents, which you see in the uh, the lower left photo, or these passive uh, square metal vents that that are in the lower right photo. But again, be careful that those are not working against each other by by the uh, where they're put in the roof. Um, It, it, you'll see that uh, in the bottom of underneath the photos is the code citation, uh, which is what is considered the minimum ventilation uh, requirement. And it's based on the area of the attic and um, uh, a, a percentage or a, a ratio. And you basically need, uh, uh, it's a one, one over, uh, 300, one over 300 ratio, and this, this doesn't show it, but it's either one over 150, uh, which is one uh, square foot of ventilation for every 150 square feet of attic space, or one over 300 if there's a moisture uh, vapor uh, installed, uh, which typically with, with uh, the insulation shown in the upper right photo, that fiberglass bat insulation, the underside of that has a, uh, a vapor barrier on it. Either the, uh, it's either a paper or foil type uh, thing or uh, uh, plastic. And so that's, so you don't, you know, this isn't really that much ventilation for the space. And this, as I said earlier, won't, won't prevent ice damming. So you need more ventilation than the minimum. Um, now, if, if you're doing a roof replacement project, you can take a lot of steps to <clears throat> not, not prevent the ice dams from occurring, but to minimize or eliminate any penetration of water into the space when, ice, when and if ice dams do occur. And uh, that's done with the use of um, uh, various membrane flashings, uh, commonly called ice and water shield, uh, although that's that's actually a brand name, uh, but that's what people refer to this as, uh, ice and water shield or ice shield. And um, you can see the various areas uh, where that's typically installed um, in, in uh, at the eaves in particular and uh, the code requires uh, in certain areas, not every area, but in certain areas where uh, the temperatures, the January temperatures are cold enough uh, that ice barrier be installed along the eaves and it needs to extend up the roof to a point that's two feet inside of the, the um, exterior wall. So that can be... Um, uh, depending on the slope of the roof and how much overhang you have, uh, that can mean a couple of rows of uh, ice shield need to be installed in order to meet that requirement. Um, 
the um, the other areas in the valley, typically the the, the uh, ice shield is typically in rolls three feet wide. So you put it in the valley, you split the valley uh, 18 inches on each side. And again, if water gets under the shingles in the valley, this keeps it from penetrating into the, into the unit. Um, the the uh, same same thing you would use on a dormer. You can see the ice shield at the valley of the dormer, and also uh, on the on the roof portion of the dormer. And um, the the ice shield on sidewalls is um, typically uh, would go up the wall uh, six inches, uh, but we typically recommend 12 inches or even more um, on when we do re-roofing projects in order to really minimize any water penetration at sidewalls. And that would be like on the side of the dormer or the chimney chase that's shown in this in this photo, or the lower where the lower roof intersects the wall uh, below the upper roof in this diagram. So these things are important to do. Um, but again, they do not prevent ice dams from occurring or from forming, but they do uh, prevent the damage that occurs when they do form and when they are, uh, you know, they are uh, there for a period of time. Um, so here, uh, again, we go back where you have uh, flashings, uh, different different situations um, going up a what's, what would be a roof intersecting a, a front wall. Uh, the again, you would extend the ice shield up up the wall. Uh, you would have flashing and counter flashing, and um, all this is is meant to prevent any water moisture from penetrating into the interior space. Same thing in the lower uh, diagram. Um, we looked at that slide earlier. Now you, you can see it's pointing to what I described earlier as the kick out flashing. That that really helps to prevent moisture from escaping over the end of the gutter and running down uh, the sidewall there where uh, the, you can see the Tyvek uh, house wrap. Uh, without that kick out flashing, and, and particularly when there's ice build up, the water would tend to go over the edge, over the side of the gutter, the end of the gutter, and, and down behind uh, the siding on the wall there. Um, so again, these things, if if you have an existing roof, uh, you're, you're not typically going to retrofit this these measures into it uh, until you're ready to re-roof it, and then it's very cost effective to do that <laughs> um, and, you know, help prevent uh, prevent water penetration uh, rather than uh, uh, keep uh, keep the ice dams from forming. So uh, just to summarize this, um, what we're talking about here is uh, the a lot of these things will prevent or will minimize problems with the roof in the winter, but they also work in other parts of the year. Um, proper ventilation or, or extra ventilation will keep your attic cooler in the summer, will cut down on your cooling, uh, you know, your cooling bill, your air conditioning bill in the summer. Um, and then in the winter, uh, the same thing, proper insulation, proper ventilation will uh, cut down on heating costs to some degree, but will also uh, help to minimize uh, ice dam formation and the the uh, the damage resulting from the leaks that occur due to ice dam formation, um, and you know so it's important. Th those are two very important areas to make sure of our insulation and ventilation. It's hard to uh, s stress that too much, and you know as you, again as I talked about earlier, um, ice dams will occur. Given the right weather conditions, if you um, you know have the roof properly constructed, they can still occur. 
but improperly constructed roofs will just exacerbate the, the problems resulting from ice dams. Um, probably not a good idea to uh, go up on the roof and try to shovel it um, because it's pretty dangerous. If the roof slope is very low, it might be less dangerous, but still probably not recommended. Uh, removing the gutters is, is probably futile as well because you'll probably, you more than likely will damage the gutters. They will allow moisture, uh, you know, the, the, the snow melt to run off for a period of time. But if the temperatures are still below freezing, it'll quickly, ref it'll quickly start refreezing and just form new ice dams there. Um, heat cables are not really cost effective and still don't, they don't remove all the snow from the roof, so they tend to just allow um, ice dams to reform further up the roof. Um, and, and the same problems will occur. And, you know, the, the, uh, the only way that they'll go away is for the weather to change. Uh, however, if in re-roofing, you add the measures I just talked about with uh, ice shield and, and other measures, bigger step flashing, other things like that, uh, you can minimize or eliminate the leakage into the unit from ice damming, even if you can't, uh, you know, you can't minimize or you can't eliminate the ice dams themselves. So I want to thank everybody. Um, if you have Sorry. questions. Yeah, I'm, there's a question in uh, chat. It says, please discuss the different fasteners recommended, i.e. I uh, staples, um, shank screws, galvanized or not. Okay. Um, well, as, as far as, um, you know, the fasteners for roofing, are, um, you know, properly installed roofing doesn't really need special fasteners. Um, typically, uh, the, the nails are covered. Uh, if you're, if you have anything exposed, you probably want to use galvanized. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I would recommend using nails on the shingles rather than staples. Um, I think they hold better. Uh, but you know, I, again, they, as far as corrosion, they shouldn't really have problems. Um, you know, with regard to that. Um, and, you know, just standard roofing nails would, would be fine to put shingles on. The flashing, the same thing, you can use roofing nails for the step flashing. Um, and the ice shield um, is typically, doesn't even need to be stable. It's It's got adhesive on the one side and it is just stuck to the roof sheathing. And, um, the adhesive works very well because if you've ever seen somebody or tried to uh, remove ice shield from a roof, uh, it's it's really virtually impossible to do. Um, so you don't really need fasteners at all for that. Um, John, what is the spacing of the nails? I'm sorry? The spacing? The spacing yeah. On the shingles? Uh, on the nails. It, dep yeah. uh, it depends on... Um, your location. If it's a high wind area, which is determined by the code, uh, they're required to have six nails per shingle. And then uh, not a high wind area, it's typically four nails per shingle. Anything else? Do you recommend not replacing the roof during the winter? Yes, I would not. Well, it, it's it's definitely not recommended or not optimal. Shingles, typically roof shingles can be installed uh, when the temperature is around 40 degrees or warmer. Uh, the, um, it's, it's, the manufacturers don't recommend it with lower temperatures Although in my experience, um, they won't specifically say it's prohibited, but typically if, if we were running a project, I would really discourage the roofers from being out there when the temperature is below freezing. Um, 
but but it's it's not the optimum time to do it. However, if you have issues that are causing a lot of damage, you know, inside, and I'm not talking about ice damming, but other conditions, and and it's sort of a you know an emergency type situation, then yeah, it can be done. Uh, it would typically you'd want to do it um, as I said, temperatures forty degrees or higher. Uh, one of, one of the things that is a problem when you put shingles on when it's cold, the shingles seal to themselves. If you ever saw a shingle, there's there's a sealing strips at the bottom of the shingle. So when it overlaps the shingle uh, uh, below it, they seal to each other and they form a solid unit eventually. It's harder and it they don't seal as well when the temperatures are cold because the the sealant doesn't uh, doesn't become adhesive until a, a warmer temperature. So I would I wouldn't recommend a roof, but it can be done. Okay. Um, somebody had a question about the presentation. I will be sending out a copy of the a PDF of the, this presentation, as well as a link um, to the video once it's up on the website. Um, and if you do. Um, if you would like your uh, CEU uh, certificate, you can email me at jsmallwood at kipcon.com. That's J-S-M-A-L-L-W-O-O-D at K-I-P-C-O-N.com. And I'll put it in the chat as well for everybody, uh, my email address, so you can copy it down just in case. And uh, that's all for me. All right. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a good day.